In a previous video on the history of tribology, I had discussed some ancient work on tribological issues. And the last part of the ancient work was the work of Leonardo da Vinci's work. And in fact, this work was quite revolutionary for that time because this work established that coefficient of friction or friction is independent of the contact area. Da Vinci carried out experiments using the same block but in different orientations such that the contact area was different. And he found that the coefficient of friction or the frictional force was nearly same. So in fact he concluded that friction is independent of the contact area. Now in this video I would like to continue with the history of tribology and I would like to start with this work by Amantons. So in this video I will review work starting from 1699 until 1950. So these works can be considered as classical work on tribology. The, the works which actually established tribology as a science and technology of interacting surfaces. Even though Da Vinci had established the relation between friction and the normal load, but his work remained unknown to people because the sketches that he left behind were not found until quite recently. And also the studies were all represented by sketches rather than a proper scientific write-up or scientific paper. So the very first person who actually did very systematic study of friction was Amundsen's, And that's why the two of the laws of friction are known as Amundsen's law after his name. So it was in 1699 that Amundsen produced these friction laws. These are known as two friction laws. The first law of friction says that friction force is proportional to the normal load. And the second law says that friction is independent of the apparent contact area. So these two laws are attributed to Amontons because he actually he was the first person to study this in a systematic way. After 1699, in 1725, J.T. Desaguliers, he conducted some experiments on cohesion of lead and he found that that the adhesion force was quite substantial. Therefore, he also suggested that adhesion might be relevant for friction. So this work is also important in tribology because this was the first time that somebody indicated that adhesion has some contribution to friction. So far until then, adhesion was not considered as cause of friction. But later, more recent studies have clearly indicated that adhesion plays a very substantial role in friction. So therefore we can consider the Sagulier's work as an important milestone in tribological research. Euler actually was the first person who provided some mathematical relation for the coefficient of friction. Friction coefficient was equal to the tangent of the angle alpha of inclination when a solid is slid on an inclined plane. So Euler conducted the test of sliding a solid block on an inclined plane and found that mu, which is the coefficient of friction, is equal to tan alpha, where alpha is the inclination of the inclined plane. So this was the first time that friction was given a mathematical treatment. He also distinguished between static and kinetic friction coefficient because according to him, the frictional force was a balancing force for the gravitational force when solid was just about to slide. But in reality, we find that the solid actually accelerates. So if the forces, the friction force and the gravitational force balance with each other, then there is no need for the solid to accelerate as it starts. To solve this problem, he proposed that static coefficient of friction is different from kinetic. And actually he said that static coefficient of friction is larger than the kinetic coefficient of friction and therefore he was the first person to distinguish between a static and kinetic coefficient of friction. 
in 1785, Coulomb gave another law, which is now known as third law of friction. He proposed that the friction is a result of interlocking asperities. It is also known as cobblestone model. That means when two surfaces are sliding against each other, the asperities will interlock and they will interact with each other elastically. And this produces coefficient of friction. So according to this model or this law, friction is independent of sliding speed. So this is known as the third law of friction or also Coulomb's law. Now, so far people had studied friction in dry context. In 1847-49, Hirn conducted several experiments on sliding between two surfaces with lubricated with a lubrication in between. And he established that viscosity played an important role in lubricated sliding. So now sliding between two solid surfaces was no more only the interaction of the dry surfaces, but viscosity of the lubricant that was present in between played a very important role. He established a linear relation for friction between a journal and a bearing and the speed. Also, he established that distilled mineral oil could work as an excellent lubricant and also that air could be used as a lubricant. This was the time when oil was still being found and mineral oil was not used as a lubricant. So we can consider Hirn as the first person to demonstrate that mineral oil could be used as an excellent lubricant as well as air could be used as a lubricant. So today we used gas bearing. So those are the bearings lubricated by air. Now we come to 1881. Hers actually gave a very very important relation. So Hers analytically calculated the area of contact between two solid surfaces in the elastic deformation range. So if two surfaces or two solids are interacting within the elastic deformation range, we can find out the contact area. So this was a milestone in contact mechanics and also in tribology. So in fact, Hertz equation is still used to estimate the contact area between two surfaces. For example, contact area between a sphere and a plane surface. So this one was, this study was a milestone in tribological research. Now we come to more studies on lubrication. Petrov conducted lubrication study in machines, specifically the journal bearings. He proposed that friction in adequately lubricated bearing is due to the viscous sharing of the fluid between the journal and the bearing surfaces. So he conducted journal bearing experiments and proposed that viscous sharing of the fluid was responsible for the friction. So this, by this time, it was now established that in a lubricated sliding, the viscosity plays extremely important role. And in fact, he gave an equation for the friction in journal bearing. And that relation is also known as Petrov's equation. But in the same year, 1883, Tower conducted an experiment of journal bearing. So he published experimental work on lubrication of journal bearing and showed that there was lubricant pressure in the bearing, which could have separated the bearing from the journal surface by a fluid film. So Tower established that in a journal bearing situation, there could be lubricant pressure acting in between. And this pressure is enough to support the bearing load and therefore it can form or it can allow a lubricant film to be formed between the journal and the bearing. So this work by Tower in 1883 and in 1885 established that in a journal bearing situation, it is not only the viscosity playing role, but the viscosity can lead to what is now known as hydrodynamic pressure. And this pressure is the one which can actually lift the bearing surface or support the bearing load. So therefore, the dynamics or the rotational speed of the journal plays a very vital role in supporting the bearing load. After Tower's experimental work, Reynolds in 1886 brought a theory and this theory is now known as hydrodynamic lubrication theory. Reynolds provided hydrodynamic calculation to show theoretically that an oil pressure and fluid film is developed 
in adequately lubricated bearing. His analysis led to the theory of hydrodynamic lubrication. So this was a major milestone in lubrication theory because most of the journal bearing now work in the hydrodynamic lubrication regime. Therefore, it can support the bearing load and form a fluid film between the bearing and the journal. And therefore, the wear can be reduced to nearly zero. RD and Berkhamshaw actually conducted some experiments in lubricated sliding. and They found that in addition to the viscosity playing a role, the boundary lubrication was another factor for lubrication. That means for steel surfaces, boundary lubrication, a boundary lubricant is formed on the steel surface, which consists of the organic molecules. So for example, he conducted experiments in carboxylic acid and alcohol liquids. Primary layer or boundary layer and some orientation of the long molecular chains was responsible for low friction after an initial high friction as sliding commenced. So that means these molecular chains or long molecules have affinity to bond with the steel surface and therefore form a primary layer or boundary layer. So this work was the, the very first work in which the boundary layer lubrication was recognized. Now in the dry sliding case, Prantel and Tomlinson, they independently were working and they independently proposed that two surfaces can undergo sliding without wear. The energy is dissipated when the atoms of one surface move in a periodic manner over the atoms of the other surface due to periodic potential. They were the first to propose friction based on atomic understanding or atomic theory. So this periodic potential leads to stick slip motion of the atoms. Energy is dissipated by lattice vibration and generation of phonons. So according to them, the atoms actually slide over each other. The atoms of the two surfaces will slide over each other only affecting their positions without any wear. So the atoms will not be knocked out of the, their position, but they will interact with each other within the intermolecular or interatomic force. So because of this interaction, the atoms or the lattice can go into vibration and generation of phonons as well as generation of heat. So these are the methods by which the energy is dissipated and this is the energy that we measure as friction. So this theory was the very first in which friction was explained based on atomic theory. So here we have examples of two solids, solid 1 and solid 2. These solids will come in close proximity during sliding. So when they are very close to each other, their electronic structure of the atom of this solid and the atom of this solid will interact with each other. So there will be an interaction at electronic level and because of this interaction, these atoms will be displaced slightly within the elastic range. So because of this displacement, there will be vibration. So these atoms will vibrate periodically within the elastic range. So without leaving the solid, these atoms will vibrate about their position. This periodic vibration within the elastic range is known as phonon. So because of this phonon, sound wave and heat will be produced and this will be the work of friction. So basically friction Frictional work dissipation. The frictional work dissipation will be in the form of sound and heat energy dissipation. In 1932, Bradley presented an equation for the adhesive pull of force between two hard elastic bodies, such as between a sphere and a flat surface. So this pull of force was calculated based on the surface energy of the two surfaces. So Bradley was the first person to actually bring out the attractive force between two surfaces based on the surface energy approach. 
and in fact this approach is still being used to find out the forces acting between two surfaces for example between a sphere and a flat surface so this is a very very convenient equation we can use to calculate the attractive force acting between two surfaces now we come to 1950 Bowden and Tabers proposed the junction growth two term model they propose that friction force is contributed by two phenomena first to bear the externally applied normal load and the second to overcome the attractive intermolecular forces so they were the first researchers to propose that friction has two terms the one term actually leads to the contributions from mechanical interactions so for example, mechanical interaction between asperities and the second term is purely intermolecular forces which are basically adhesive forces. So that means friction is a sum of cohesive interaction or cohesive forces and adhesive interaction or adhesive forces. This model is known as the junction growth model. In the same year, Parker and Hatch did some experimental measurement. They found that the application of tangential force to indium hemisphere on glass flat surface increases both the real and the apparent contact area. So as you apply the tangential force, the, the contact area is not the same, but it changes. And in this case, it increases. The adhesion and tangential forces vary linearly with the real and apparent area of contact. So they also found similar to Jensen growth theory that once you apply the tangential force during friction the contact area will change it will not remain the same and the adhesion and tangential forces vary according to the contact area mcfarlane and Tabor also conducted some experiments and proposed that both normal and tangential forces play part in the junction growth for metallic contacts so when there are two sur surfaces to metallic surfaces in contact the junction or the real context the actual context will change when we apply normal and tangential forces the real contact area grows under tangential force as a result of cold welding so they suggested that between metals they, it is possible that they can cold weld and therefore the junction or the contact area real contact area will grow because of the tangential force Friction and adhesion are related and they propose the relationship by analytical method. So as we found that contribution of adhesion to friction was recognized long back but only in 1950 that we have a clear understanding of what is friction. So by 1950 we have understood that friction is a combination of two types of work. One is the cohesive work that is done for the interaction of the asperities and the second one is for the adhesive work that is carried out for to overcome the intermolecular forces acting between the two surfaces so until 1950 i consider that these are all the classical work on friction and lubrication so these classical works actually helped us to understand friction and lubrication and they these works remain true and more recently we are able to actually prove this many of these findings through our better experimental techniques.